Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. An official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Today's big picture should be of considerable interest to American taxpayers who are concerned that every dollar their army lays out for new equipment shall be spent cautiously, spent for material that won't become obsolete before it gets off the production line, stuff that can positively be depended on to outperform enemy equipment if it ever has to be used in the defense of our lives and freedoms. Our big picture camera will now take you to Aberdeen, Maryland and Lieutenant John Mortimer. We've brought our big picture camera 90 miles northeast of Washington, D.C. to the Aberdeen Proving Ground. We're standing just off Route 40 near Aberdeen, Maryland. It is two miles from this point to the main entrance of the Proving Ground. Now let's see what goes on here at the Aberdeen Proving Ground through the eyes of the big picture camera. Aberdeen is a vast indoor-outdoor performance laboratory. Pilot models of new ordnance equipment are brought here and put through grueling tests before they're ever contracted for in quantity. This section of the proving ground is known as the Munson Test Area. It's here that the Automotive Test Division investigates the performance characteristics of wheeled and track vehicles. Engineers have constructed 20 miles of the world's worst roads to find out how a machine will stand up under the world's worst driving conditions. We looked up an engineer who was in charge of some testing over at what looked to be a swimming pool. What is the purpose of this test? This is the latest model of the Jeep and we are running this test to check the performance of the vehicle with the engine completely submerged. The electrical equipment on this Jeep is fully sealed and the only preparation necessary is the installation of the air intake and the exhaust extensions. I think perhaps we better step back here now, we might get wet. What does it feel like to be driving underwater? Well, it's rather cold today. It ain't bad in the summertime, but wintertime, why, well, it's pretty chilly. Very cold. Yeah, very cold. Do you have any trouble controlling the Jeep uh, underwater? Well, the wheels will spin a little bit, uh, the mud laying in the bottom, but outside of that, it has good traction, runs good underwater. Well, how many times a day do you drive through this uh, bath? Well, it just depends what type of test it's on, the vehicle, or uh, if it calls for the bathtub, why, well, it runs through the right good bit. We'd been holding up the parade, one that nobody would want to argue the right of way with. Now we have the tank in the bathtub. What is the purpose of this test? Well, the purpose of this test is to determine if the tank is capable of fording rivers and streams and to operate from landing craft. Uh, is any water getting into the tank now? Uh, normally, water wouldn't enter the tank. The, the hull is sealed. The electrical components are waterproof and the engine fans are specially equipped to prevent uh, their damage from the water. Is this a good test? Yes, it looks to be a good test. Across the road, something else was starting to go on. This is the frame twister course. We now have a five-ton truck operating on this course, towing the eight-inch howitzer. All tactical vehicles are required to go over this course to check for interferences between the sprung and the unsprung members of the chassis. Well, just what is a sprung member? The uh, sprung member would be the uh, parts above the spring, such as the body and cab, and the engine, of course. Reminded me of the road that leads up to our summer cottage. 
There were tests going on all over the place. For instance, how heavy a load could a tank be made to pull without making it stall? What is the purpose of the dynamometer test? Well, the primary purpose of the field dynamometer, as shown here, is as a power absorption device, which, when coupled to the rear of the test vehicle, as you see here, enables you to measure maximum drawbar pull at any speed within the vehicle speed range. How do you measure that drawbar pull? That pull is measured by an electronic strain gauge drawbar, which is mounted on the front of the dynamometer. Well, now, this uh, dynamometer can actually stop the tank. Is that correct? That's right. It can hold the tank down to a stall condition and measure the maximum pull the, the vehicle has at that stall condition. All this sounded most impressive. And if I could have been sure about what all of it meant, it likely might have sounded even more so. The next test was more to my understanding. This is the 30-inch vertical wall, one of the obstacles we have here in the Munson test area to simulate conditions likely to be encountered during cross-country operation. The test is ready. There he goes. He's coming up against the wall. He's up top. That's quite a wall there. There he goes. From this small-time climbing, we went to big-time climbing. What is the purpose of having this tank climb this 60% slope? It is one of a number of performance tests made here at Aberdeen Proving Ground to ensure that the vehicle will meet its service requirements. Uh, just what is a 60% slope? A 60% slope is equal to approximately a 31 degree slope. What is the rate of climb? That would be climbing 60 feet for every 100 feet of horizontal travel. Well, I hear that the driver is ready, so maybe we better move on out of here. That was quite a climb. How does it feel to be coming up a 60% slope? Well, it's not too bad. Uh, we've uh, done this several times, and uh, especially with this tank, you know you're going to make it, so it's not too bad. Well, what would happen if you had to stop? Can you start up again? Yes, uh, we can uh, stop right in the middle of the slopes, and uh, we have sufficient braking to hold the vehicle there, and then you can start again and come on up. Well, you've been driving vehicles here for quite a bit of time. How long have you been driving test vehicles? I've been, driving, I've been driving test vehicles for about 13 years. 13 years, all the time at the Munson test area? Well, uh, the Munson test area in uh, Paramount and also Churchville. Well, keep up the good work. Keeping up good work. How about the 280 atomic gun and any test studies that might be going on here along this line? It's one thing for us to have an atomic cannon that's the biggest, heaviest gun in the world, but it's something else to be sure that the big gun's weight is so distributed that it can be safely driven across a military bridge. The gauge, with the moving hand, is measuring the strains on the bridge's structure. They told me that this monster tips the scales at around 85 tons, but nevertheless, it appeared it could be depended upon to get places where it might be needed. It turned a corner like a hook and ladder fire engine. Only with this contraption, the driver in the rear doesn't just steer some hind wheels. He's got an engine to drive, just the same as the fellows got up in the front. The colonel and I walked over to see if perhaps we couldn't get some first-hand information. What is it like to drive such a big vehicle? Well, it's comparatively easy after you get used to it. It takes a little while to get used to it, but after that, it's very simple, just like driving any ordinary truck. 
Well, do you ever have any trouble of one stopping and the other trying to go? No, not yet, we haven't. Well, how do you, are you uh, in communications with the man in the back truck now? That's right, by this radio. And, and you control the whole vehicle? I can, or he can't either one, except for the brakes. Now, how do you con contact him to move out? By radio. All right, will you take off now? Right. Contact him. Russ, let's go. Later in the day, we observed some further tests on the 280. Lieutenant, uh, just what is the purpose of this test and this elaborate setup? Now, this afternoon, we are engaged in the acceptance testing of the 280 millimeter gun, carriage, and projectile. And that tower to my rear is the velocity tower, which will measure the velocity of the projectile as it uh, comes forth from the muzzle. I see. Now, well, they've got the projector right up there now. Is she all ready, John? All ready for ramming. Okay, ram! What is the range of this gun? The range is approximately 20 miles. However, before firing, we have to take a safety check with our safety man, Mr. Webster. Webb? Can you give us a check on that range down there? W from 391, Norman, give us a clearance count. 280 millimeter, approximately 20 miles. W9, 11, and 25, man, a clearance for the 280. All clear, nine. All clear, W11. Three nine one from W okay to fire. Clearance five eight. Clearance number five eight. Clearance five eight. We're all set to uh, fire then. That's correct. The gun is now ready for firing. It'll elevate it to the proper elevation for firing through the coils. The gun has been primed. Once it's at its proper elevation, we'll attach the lanyard to the firing magneto and send this one on its way. A few final checks here. Has to be pretty accurate, doesn't it, Lieutenant? That's that's quite correct, because if uh, it's off more uh, more than one mil either way, we may have a damaged coil up there. Chronograph and instrumentation are all ready. Our recording devices are all set now. The crew chief is now attaching the lanyard to the magneto box, and we'll be ready in just one second to fire it. We're all ready now. From big guns to small guns. What will you be checking on this 105 recoilless rifle? Well, we're uh, bore sighting the 105 millimeter recoilless rifle at the present time. Uh, that's to check it for accuracy, is that it? Uh, this uh, bore sighting aligns the axis of the tube with the, uh, bore, uh, the crosshairs on the sight of the rifle. Uh, this uh, enables the rifle to shoot where the gunner looks when he looks through his sight. Well, now uh, it looks like they're just about ready for the test, is that right? Yes, they are. They're, they're uh, ready for the test right now. Are you ready to fire? Was that a successful test? Yes, it was. The rifle has now been proofed and it's ready for combat. And we were ready to move on. We passed by the Aberdeen Ordnance Depot, which receives and stores major items of Ordnance General Supplies. The main mission of the depot these days is the maintenance and warehousing of small arms and artillery pieces. Finally, we ended up at the supersonic wind tunnel laboratory. It was in this building during the period between 1944 and 1947 
that the basic planning of our devastating guided missile was accomplished. I was interested in what sort of things might be going on here in 1954. Now will you tell us about this? To <clears throat> change the velocity in a supersonic wind tunnel, it is necessary to vary the shape upstream of the model being tested. Rather than replace this particular section each time we desire to change the velocity, we flex steel plates as indicated here to form the proper contour. For this particular setting, a definite velocity is obtained at this point where the model is installed. The plates are positioned by motor-driven jacks, which you can see here. These jacks are symmetrically placed so that the top and bottom plates always move the same distance. Now, where is the model? The model is located approximately the center of the wind tunnel. Uh, we have a 36-inch viewing window at this point. The test today is on a guided missile. The purpose of this test is to determine uh, proper shape and size of control surfaces for stability and directional control. Private Dustin, will you install this model in the test section now? I imagine you have to secure the model in the tunnel pretty, pretty well. Yes, you do, because the shock waves uh, vibrating off of the uh, top and bottom plates of the tunnel cause excessive vibration. How do you contact the compressors? The uh, crew chief in charge calls the compressor room by a loudspeaker system. You're just about ready to start the motors now. Yes, the crew chief is uh, uh, starting the uh, seal system, which uh, eliminates any moisture from, get, uh, from atmosphere getting into the tunnel. Compressor room. This is um, box number 2.17, single stage, blow down. And you may open 15 and 16 and put on 1, 2, 3, and 4, please. Okay. The compressors being used for this test are 3,000 horsepower each. Uh, we will be using four compressors. At what uh, what's okay, a pressure are you going to build up? Thank you. We will build up to a slightly over atmospheric pressure on the supply side. The master road, the Mach number is 2.17, single stage, blow down start. You may open 15 and 16 and put on compressors 1, 2, 3, and 4, please. Okay. Compression ratio is building up in the tunnel now. Uh, as you will see on the screen, the Mach number is about one. Shortly you will notice a sudden change. There it goes now from below the speed of sound to somewhat over two times the speed of sound or approximately 1,500 miles per hour. We're running at top pressure now. The uh, pressure is somewhat over atmospheric pressure. Uh, however, the uh, test section pressure is only about one third atmospheric. What do you conclude from this test? Well, it's been determined that the missile being tested is stable, but the control surfaces were not large enough to give the desired directional control. These surfaces will now be replaced by larger movable surfaces, and more tests will be conducted. More guided missile tests, he meant, but the next one we were to observe would be concerned with the flight characteristics of conventional projectiles. This building, they told us, is known as a transonic range. During the three years it's been in operation, researchers have had opportunities to make multiple photographs of the flight of some 2,000 rounds 
of experimental ammunition. Findings brought to light have already resulted in development of two radically new types of projectiles. What will you be checking in this test? Why, we are checking the flight test performance of a fin missile at sonic velocity. Now, all missiles tend to oscillate as they fly through the air. However, uh, around sonic velocity, these oscillations have a tendency to build up very large. And this, of course, is unsatisfactory. Now, that is what we're really checking on this test. Now, you see the program engineer is taking the model in its plastic carrier up to the tank, and this test will begin in just a few minutes. In this test, the projectile will fly through this 1173-foot range, and its shadow will be photographed twice at each of the 25 camera stations to give us the necessary data. We're just about ready for this test. Jim, are you all ready? Here, as in all other areas the proving ground we had visited, rigidly enforced safety controls preceded the firing. This is the type of test that we run here every day in the year. The uh, photographs of the missile in flight in the range will be sent to the data reduction section. Uh, there, the data will be reduced for the program engineer uh, in making his report. Of course, no visit to the Aberdeen Proving Ground would be complete without stopping in at its famous Ordnance Museum. More than 5,000 items of military equipment are on display in the Aberdeen Collection, which includes a first-rate assortment of captured enemy equipment. More than just an army attic of old curios, the collection contributes to the perfection of new ordnance by making possible comparison studies with foreign equipment. The big picture camera is coming inside the main building where we will ask Mr. Jarrett, the curator, to tell us about some of the items you may be interested in. This is a copy of the World War II type American Jeep. It's rather interesting because it actually has a Model A Ford engine as the power plant. Now, if you'd like to see something else, we can go on down this way. This is a German V2. It's one that we obtained after the war from the uh, Nordhausen assembly area. German V2 is a rather unusual type of rocket. It's a rocket that uses alcohol as a fuel. It is fired into the air driven tremendous distances, about 200 miles. The apex of its trajectory is about 60 miles high. It's all done with a burner that you see here. This burner burns the alcohol in the presence of oxygen. And that is the method in which this great range was attained. Very, very interesting specimen, and one that attracts quite a lot of attention to visitors at the museum. This is a German Volkswagen. Actually, this is the amphibious type of Volkswagen. It's rather interesting because it's entirely uh, made like a boat, yet it runs like an automobile. It's really quite interesting and is very seaworthy. One of the most interesting features is the spare tire, which is on the front. If that tire is not there, then the waves break over it. As long as the tire's there, you can take pretty good waves with it. It's really a lot of fun to ride around in, and. The duck hunters down here always want to uh, come borrow our boat. Can we uh, look at some of the tanks further down the line right. here? Yes, indeed. We have one or two tanks down there that I think would be uh, uh, worthwhile having a look at. How about the Panther? All right. This is the tank to which I was referring. This is the German heavy tank known as the Panther, probably one of the best of the German tanks during the World War II period. It fired two very interesting projectiles because of their great power. The real power came from this unusually long tube, which you see from the turret. That gun was capable of causing a great deal of damage to enemy tanks.
This compared to what tank in the American Army during the Second World War? Well, this is a tank that uh, is hardly like the American tanks because we had an entirely different kind of tank. Our tanks were uh, extremely maneuverable, whereas this was a heavy tank. Actually, this tank is quite heavy at almost 50 tons. Now, will this tank uh, still work, uh, perform? Oh, yes, this tank is in good running order. You'll notice the turret and the gun. It's quite capable of being moved without any particular effort. We have a number of other things because you've seen now a number of the heavier items. But I would like to show you some of the small arms. These are some of the smaller pieces in the museum to which I refer to a collection of submachine guns from the 1918 gun of the German army on through to the modern times. Now these are mostly uh, foreign weapons. Yes, they're mostly foreign weapons, although we have a few of the American developments during that period of time. For the most part, they are foreign weapons. Since you have seen uh, most of the pieces here in the museum, I wonder if you wouldn't like to go out and see our artillery park where we have both tanks and artillery pieces. We have quite a number of tanks here. They represent from World War I through World War II, and each one of them has developed some little point which we have found of interest. Sometimes these things are used to make our own tanks more powerful, or we know that our tanks are superior. Now, there are several tanks in question here. The one over there that is kind of light in color is our first heavy tank, in a sense, that we introduced in the war by way of the British Eighth Army in the Western Desert. A little to the left of that, you will see two breathers on top of a light tank. That came as a development from the earlier stages of the war, so that by the time the Normandy landings, we had a tank that could wade ashore and not be drowned out. A little further to the left, you will see a strange-looking vehicle that actually was one of the first of the self-propelled weapons with which we developed as early as 1916, believe it or not. This is all just a part of the phase of work going on here at the Proving Ground where they test for the best. Test for the best. That's the story of the Aberdeen Proving Ground. And this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again next week for another story of The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today. The United States Army.